As night falls, everything sinks into a soft blue darkness under a blanket of twinkling stars. In a nice, cozy home, in a normal, quiet suburb, a sweet little boy is being read a bedtime story by his mother. It's a classic, Little Red Riding Hood, the story of a little girl traveling through the woods to her grandmother's house, only to be set upon by the big bad wolf. A tale as old as time, with an important message for people of all ages. We should fear what lurks in the dark, since what is there is often waiting and watching with hungry eyes. As the boy lays in bed, clutching the top of his blanket, his mother continues telling him the tale. She describes the tiny girl in the red hood, holding a little wicker basket, stumbling through the dark. The wolf, with its big, hungry eyes, weaves through the darkness of the trees, following her every move. The little boy can barely contain his fear when Little Red Riding Hood opens the door to her grandmother's old cottage and creeps inside, where she realizes that something is very wrong. Her grandmother looks different. Those great big eyes, that twitching wet black nose, those huge terrible teeth dripping with saliva. All the better to eat you with, my dear. His mother senses that her son isn't taking this well and notices that he's shuddering underneath the blankets. She closes the book, smiles, and insists that the story has a happy ending. This does nothing to ease the growing specter of fear stretching out over the boy. Could the big bad wolf be waiting outside his window, watching him with those red, ravenous eyes? Would the window really keep such a monster at bay? He doesn't feel so sure. The little boy's mother kisses him on the forehead and tells him that if he needs anything, she and his father are just down the hall. He's been having nightmares lately, but that's all they are. Nightmares, all in his head. Nothing in there could actually hurt him. He's alone now, shivering in bed, trying to focus on the light of his tiny nightlight plugged into his wall, a little glowing friend that will watch over him and keep him safe. His mom and dad got it for him when he told them he was afraid of the dark, but there's still a lot more dark in this room than light. His closet door suddenly creaks open, and he bites his tongue to stifle a scream. It's an old door, it opens by itself sometimes. There's nothing to worry about, nothing to worry about at all. It's a mantra his parents had drilled into him on prior instances when this door had creaked open. Even in the dark, the little boy can make out something. It looks like one of the many other shadows created by his nightlight, but it's different. Something darker than the dark. And it's moving, sliding out of his closet. A fog shaped like some unknowable creature. There's nothing to worry about, nothing to worry about at all, he tells himself over and over again. The fog leaves the closet entirely, and it starts getting closer to the boy's bed. As it rises up from the floor, the boy can see something in the fog. He can see eyes. Big, glowing, hungry eyes. Like the eyes of a big bad wolf, ready to eat him alive. He opens his mouth to scream, but only a yawn comes out. He wants to get up and run to his parents' room down the hall, but his body feels so heavy, his movements so slow and sluggish. He can't move, and the eyes of the monster made of dark keep getting closer. There's nothing to worry about, nothing to... Mom, Dad, please help me. All he can do is think about screaming, not actually make any noise, as his eyes shut, and he drifts off into the land of dreams. He opens his eyes to find that he's standing in a dark and endless forest. The trees are tall, extending up into a black and starless sky but there's something wrong with them. Bodies, hundreds of them, old and desiccated, are speared onto their branches, their faces locked into what looks like permanent, silent screams. A thick, viscous black liquid drips from some of the bodies, pooling into what looks like puddles of tar around his feet. When he looks down, he sees that he's wearing strange, old-fashioned clothes. His shirt is bright red. There's a low, bassy growling behind him, like thunder, like a rumbling earthquake primal and deadly. He can feel it vibrating in his bones. Moving slowly, as though he was underwater, he turns and sees the beast looming behind him. A giant, wolf-like monster made from shadows, teeth cut from jagged black glass, eyes glowing and hungry. He's never been so terrified in his life as he is right now, standing in front of this monster that seemed to be the literal embodiment of fear. The embodiment of deep, animal terror. The beast that haunts the dreams of every frightened boy and girl. It growls again, and he begins to run. 
But it's not real running. It's dream running, as if the gravity were too strong, slow and cumbersome through the thick, confining air. He keeps pushing through the resistance all around him, but the wolf made of shadows moves quickly. It weaves through the trees, its mouth dripping wet with hunger, its eyes emitting a dim glow like the nightlight back in his bedroom. He runs for what feels like hours, tears streaking down his cheeks, until finally he can see salvation in the distance, a house standing in the middle of a clearing in the woods. But not just any house, it's his house. In the logic of the dream, he knew that his mom and dad would be inside. They'd help him, they'd keep him safe from the monster. He just needs to get there, he just needs to survive. He finally reaches the front door and tries to open it, but it's locked. So he hammers his fists against the wood, screaming and crying for his parents. He looks over his shoulder and sees the shadow wolf charging towards him through the darkness of the woods, its huge dark feet hitting the ground with the speed and force of gunshots, getting closer and closer and closer. With one final desperate pound of his fist, the door to his home finally swings open and he falls through. The door closes behind him as he hits the floor, and the sound of the wolf is gone. He gets up and looks out of a nearby window to see that there's no forest outside, just his neighborhood again, underneath a starless sky. He looks down and sees he's not wearing those strange, old-fashioned clothes anymore, just the same pajamas he'd worn to bed. Are things back to normal now? Had it all been a dream? He tries a nearby light switch, but nothing happens, still dark. That dread comes creeping back in. If it had been a dream, what did that make this? He starts making his way up the stairs, calling out to his mom and dad, but there's no response. He climbs further, walking down the hallway towards their bedroom door. The hallway seems so much longer than he remembered it, but for some reason, he never stops to question the discrepancy. He just wants his mother and father. Not long after, the little boy reaches the door to his parents' bedroom and opens it. The room is so dark, but he can make out their forms lying in the bed. He approaches, calling for them again, but there's no response. Instead, he just hears an awful wheezing sound, like air being let out of a balloon. When his eyes adjust to the dark, he sees that something is terribly wrong with both of his parents. They're now old and thin, with sickly yellowing skin hanging from their bones. Their eyes, milky with cataracts, are set deep in their jaundiced faces. The mere sight of them forces a gasp out of him. Their heads slowly turn with audible crunches, their chests rise and fall in those same slow, mechanical exhalations. They both look like life hurts for them now. The little boy begins to cry. They beckon him closer, wanting to comfort him, but he's too terrified of their appearance to take a single step towards them. His mother opens her thin-lipped mouth, revealing rotten teeth, and says, Sweetheart, I'm so sorry. But mommy and daddy can't take care of you anymore. We can't even be here for much longer. We need to go. I'm sorry that we don't have more time. The little boy can see his parents aging by the second, getting thinner and frailer and sicker right in front of him. His pity and fear outweighs his revulsion, and he steps forward to embrace them. They're so terribly cold. He grips his mother's hand, but he can feel the bones turning to dust inside her paper-thin skin. It's going to be okay, darling, she whispers, her voice hoarse and brittle in her final moments. Your grandmother will take care of you from now on. That's when he hears it behind him again, that terrible, low rumble, the primal growl. As his parents both turn to dust in their bed, he turns and sees the monster, the same wolf made of shadows, filling up the doorway. It seems even bigger in here, bulging through the doorway, thick black saliva dripping from its obsidian fangs. He tries to repeat that same mantra to himself. There's nothing to worry about, nothing to worry about at all. But suddenly he's short of breath, as an immense shadowy claw closes around his torso. It lifts him up off the ground until he can feel the beast's breath on his face. But it isn't hot like it should be. It's freezing, like a gust of wind in the deep snow. With a deep, commanding voice, the monster says, only lucky children get to wake up from a dream like this. And not everyone can be lucky. All he can do is scream when the wolf's jaws close around his head. But not a soul can hear him. He's swallowed up into the darkness of the monster. And soon, he's nothing at all. In the waking world, 
The sun rises, morning birds caw and tweet, alarms go off. But when the little boy's mother checks his bed that morning, it's empty. He's vanished without a trace. In the panic of the days, weeks, and months that follow, in the extensive search that turns up nothing, and that unlucky little boy was never seen again, it never even occurs to his parents to ask, did we leave that closet door open? Did you suffer from bad dreams as a child? Night terrors? There's no shame in it. It's not an uncommon affliction after all. Perhaps there's a hazy, half-formed memory in your mind of waking up screaming when your parents turned on the lights, comforting you, telling you that it was just a bad dream and nothing more. But what if it wasn't? What if it was SCP-080? This vaporous entity, nicknamed the Dark Form by some who have worked with it, is every child's worst nightmare. And if you give it a chance, every adult's worst nightmare too. That's because this black, smoke-like figure has the anomalous ability to induce extreme drowsiness in anyone who spends more than half an hour near it in the dark. Shortly after falling asleep, if nobody comes in and rescues the victim by turning on the lights, they will experience the most horrible nightmares you can possibly imagine. So horrible, in fact, that those who have suffered these nightmares and survive often experience irreparable, lifelong psychological trauma. And in the grand scheme of things, those are still the lucky ones. If you're unlucky, like the little boy who vanished from his bed, you'll disappear forever, consumed by SCP-080. The creature itself is difficult to properly see due to its lack of consistent form and due to the fact that it only appears in the darkness, but those who have witnessed it can only seem to remember one key detail, glowing eyes in the smoke. Because of its preference for dark places, SCP-080 often takes refuge in closets and under the bed, where it can vanish out of sight. Bright light automatically causes the creature to disappear and manifest elsewhere, and therefore, should you start feeling unusually drowsy in the dark, turning on the lights is the best thing to do. But these must be bright lights. The soft glow of a standard children's nightlight is not powerful enough to ward off the creature. The SCP Foundation conducted a series of experiments, hoping to see whether SCP-080 had any kind of real physical body, and if it was possible for human beings to safely interact with it. In the first of these experiments, a 19-year-old male D-Class was sent into the chamber to interact with SCP-080. Unsurprisingly, he immediately became extremely distressed upon seeing the figure with glowing eyes forming in the dark. He described it as being human-shaped, but far too big to be a human. He begged to be released from the chamber, but by this point, he'd already started yawning and the drowsiness was setting in. The researchers running the experiment wanted to see what would happen next though, and eventually his pleas to be released fell silent as he drifted off to sleep. When guards were finally sent in to check on him, they found… nothing at all. Nothing remained of the D-Class. He'd been consumed by SCP-080, just like so many others. Next, a 30-year-old female D-Class was sent into SCP-080's chamber. When she was able to make out the vaporous form with the glowing eyes, she was instructed to try and physically touch it. She followed the orders. However, upon touching the entity directly, she immediately fell unconscious. She was quickly retrieved from the room, since the Foundation wanted to make sure they could interview her rather than letting SCP-080 consume her. According to a physical exam given to her by the Foundation medics, she'd experienced no physical effects. Her mind, on the other hand, was a very different story. She'd vacillate wildly between a state of borderline catatonia and extreme paranoid distress. In a debriefing meeting with a Foundation researcher, she had difficulty recounting what exactly had happened during her test with SCP-080. When she did begin to recollect, she started screaming in terror and yelling about how they would try to take her back to the monster. Then, without warning, she leaped across the table and began to attack the researcher, forcing the attending guards to intervene, and unfortunately, they were forced to terminate her. It seemed as though this was always the intended effect of her outburst. She preferred death from a Foundation guard over experiencing SCP-080 again. The testing continued, though, and a third subject was sent into the room, a 24-year-old D-Class male dosed on a powerful amphetamine to hopefully ward off the drowsiness-inducing effects of SCP-080. This did not appear to work, though, and over time, the same sleepiness started to set in. The amphetamine, however, still caused elevated levels of aggression, and the D-Class began to express violent intent towards SCP-080. He approached the vaporous mass and attempted to strike it, but when his fist touched the entity, he immediately collapsed. 
When his body was retrieved, it was found that he died of a sudden massive heart attack. During the autopsy, as Foundation staff examined his body, they reported feeling a profound sense of discomfort and unease, as though they were being watched. The retrieval team also reported feeling acutely aware of SCP-080 watching them as they exited the chamber with the final D-Class's body. The mere presence of SCP-080 then started causing problems for some staff members at the containment site. The researchers assigned to SCP-080 reported strange and unsettling dreams and that they were occurring at an unusually frequent level, disrupting their sleep patterns and, by extension, their work performance. This led to them discovering the possibility that SCP-080 may have some kind of hazardous mimetic effect that can linger among its victims even when they aren't in its direct proximity. After the lead researcher on the team walked into traffic and sadly passed away, it was made mandatory for all staff members working in SCP-080's sector to keep comprehensive dream journals so that the emergence of patterns of violent or unsettling dreams could be detected before things got too out of hand, just like they had with the lead researcher. However, the lead researcher would not be the last to lose his life to SCP-080. Two researchers stood just beyond the blackout curtains, observing SCP-080 for 40 minutes, believing that the divider would keep them safe from SCP-080's negative anomalous effects. They were terribly wrong. Both apparently fell asleep in the observation area, and when another researcher later entered the room, they discovered that their bodies were gone. However, strangely enough, Everyone working in that sector of the site found that they did have a better night's sleep after the incident. Staff were reminded to exercise maximum caution whenever interfacing with SCP-080. Their direct exposure should never exceed 30 minutes under any circumstances, even the section of staff members that, for some reason, are completely unable to see SCP-080 and appear to somehow be immune to its effects. Considering the fact that everyone around the site started feeling better after the strange incident concerning the two missing researchers, researchers have sought O5 Council permission to feed a D-Class to the monster once a month in order to negate the damaging effects it has on site staff mental health. Despite the protests of the Ethics Committee, a member of the Council approved the measure. SCP-080 is contained in a 4 meter by 4 meter room with a smaller antechamber located on the south wall for easy research access. There's also an observation room on the north wall, separated with blackout curtains to prevent light from getting in and dispersing SCP-080. Containment procedures dictate that SCP-080 should never, under any circumstances, be removed from the chamber. Any light-producing devices are also forbidden. While the Foundation currently has this monster under lock and key, all it would take is a stray ray of light to free it once more, which has warranted it being given the Euclid containment class. All members of staff are also kindly remembered to stop referring to this creature as the Boogeyman. After all, there's a lot of power in giving a fear-manipulating creature a name like that, and the last thing we want is SCP-080 having more power than it already has. Now go and watch another entry from the classified files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-1471, Mallow version 1.0.0 for another SCP that won't leave you alone once it has you in its sights. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.